The following presentation was produced by St. Joseph Communications. Jeff Cavins is the director of the Archbishop Harry J. Flynn Catechetical Institute, based in St. Paul, Minnesota. As the founding host of EWTN's Life on the Rock, he has been recognized both nationally and internationally as an exciting public speaker who has a deep love for Jesus Christ and who communicates his zeal with clarity and enthusiasm. Over the past several years, Jeff has dedicated his life to developing The Great Adventure, an extremely useful and practical interactive Bible study system that enables students to understand the chronological flow of Scripture. Here now is Jeff Cavins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we love you as our Lord, our King, our Shepherd. We give you ourselves completely and we ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and our minds that we would understand wonderful things from your word. I pray, Lord Jesus, that wherever we're at, if we're in the church, we're not in the church, we're thinking about leaving, thinking about coming back, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that this would be your message. Help me, Lord, today. Help all of us to hear you. We also ask for the intercession of Our Lady. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to just give sort of an introduction as to uh, my background and why I'm up here speaking today. I was raised in the Catholic Church, and I was a product of the 1960s and early 1970s, where the, many people believed in an eighth sacrament called the Sacrament of Holy Osmosis, which was that if you drop your kids off at church, they'll get everything. And it didn't work with me, and I think since then we have dismissed that, no longer part of our, our repertoire. But it, seriously, I, I was part of that whole growing up in the 60s, where by the time I graduated from high school, I knew very little about my faith. But I had a real hunger to know who God was as an 18-year-old boy walking around in my six-inch platform Elton John shoes, my white bell-bottoms and hair down to here. I had a hunger to know who God was, and I wanted to know who he was, and I started reading books on Eastern religions and meditation and things like that, and that eventually led me to meet a girl in college who told me about Jesus Christ. Only after a few weeks of listening to her, I began to cry, 18 years old, and I gave my life to Christ, and I said, you can do anything with my life that you want, and the Lord did. I ended up leaving the Catholic Church in rebellion, in anger, by the time I was about 21 years old. I ended up going back to school and I became a Protestant pastor. I started off in radio, in Christian radio, and then I went back to school and became a Protestant pastor. The only thing growing up that I wanted to do was to be in radio and TV. That's all I wanted to do growing up, is to do that. And uh, I eventually had this relationship with the Lord and left the church, and I thought somehow I could combine the media with this message and share with people about Jesus Christ. Well, I was outside of the church for a number of years, but 12 of those years I was a Protestant pastor. But I eventually came back to the Catholic Church based on the teachings of the Catholic Church, based on Scripture, but more than anything else, it was the Eucharist that brought me back to the church. And in retrospect now, I would have to say that if I would have understood the Eucharist, I would have never left. And what I want to share with you today is a teaching on being fed. Because as I travel around the country and talk to different people, and I get letters from people who watch the various shows on EWTN, one of the consistent statements that I get is this statement, well, Jeff, that's good for you. I mean, that's nice that you went back, and that's good for you. It's like... You know, it's like some kind of drug that worked, you know, (laughs) on me. That's good for you. But we had to leave because, you see, we weren't being fed in the Catholic Church. And I heard this, and I heard this, 
And then I started to think to myself, wait a minute, I've got to respond to this. How many of you have ever heard that before? I wasn't being fed. Now, I know what they mean, and you know what they mean. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. What they really mean when they say, I wasn't being fed. But by the time that we're done today, I think that we're going to be able to completely dismiss this notion of, I wasn't spiritually being fed. Either they, either they didn't know what was happening in the Mass, or they are blasphemous. Blasphemous. Either they're ignorant and don't know, like I was ignorant and didn't know, or we are blasphemous. I want to start off in answering this question, I wasn't being fed. Someone says, I wasn't being fed. I want to start off by asking a question, and that is this. Who ultimately has the responsibility to feed you? We have a spiritual hunger in our lives. Wouldn't you admit St. Augustine said that we will be restless until we rest in, in him. And you and I have a hunger in our hearts. And you can see this even manifest in the physical, where we'll be sitting there at 10 o'clock at night watching the news. And, and we're not particularly hungry, but there's just something kind of agitating us. And we'll get up and we'll go over to the refrigerator, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, and we'll open it up and we'll look inside there. You just gaze on every shelf. All these leftovers and things like that. And you look at it and you shut it and you go back and you sit down. You watch the news for a few more minutes and then you get up and you go up to a cupboard and you open that and you sit there and look. It's like there's something in us. There's a hunger, a restlessness inside of us. And that's true spiritually too. As you are hungry physically, you are hungry spiritually. And you will find some place to eat. Whether it's in the church or whether it's down the street at World Victory Outreach Center, or up the street at Maranatha World Outreach Center, or down the street at so-and-so assembly, you'll find a place to be fed. You'll find a place to be fed. But the question is this, two questions really. Number one, who has the responsibility to feed you? Who took that responsibility to feed you? And two, what is he going to feed you? Now, if it's the man down the street who's been through three years or four years of Bible training, and he stands up and says, I have the responsibility to feed you, then that's your answer. Pastor Johnson has the responsibility ultimately to feed you. Then the second question you have to answer, what will he feed you? What will Pastor Peterson up on 4th Avenue, if he says, I have the responsibility, I have to answer to God, that may be, what's he going to feed you? What is the real hunger of your heart? I want to start off answering this question with Psalm 23. And I'll tell you at the very beginning what the answer to the question is, and I think you know it. The answer is to who has the ultimate responsibility to feed you? Who has taken the responsibility? You know who it is, don't you? Jesus Christ ultimately has taken the responsibility to feed us. And let's read Psalm 23. It starts off and says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I like the way the psalm starts off. It starts off and says, The Lord is my shepherd. And in biblical days, in New Testament days, the shepherd is the one that had the responsibility for caring for the sheep, feeding the sheep, leading them, and protecting them. And a good shepherd would ultimately lay down his life for the sheep. And the scriptures tell us the Lord is my shepherd. He is my shepherd. He is the one that is, is loving me and caring for me and directing me. Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 40 in verse 11, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures, but I'm putting together here for you a, a biblical argument. For Jesus Christ, being the shepherd who has taken on the responsibility for our souls, 
and I want to show you what he's decided to feed us. I am using the Bible today to do this. I don't want to go out and use a bunch of other things because in talking to my friends who I love, who have left the church, I want to appeal to them in Scripture. I may mention a few things here and there, but primarily I want to talk Scripture about this. Isaiah 40 and 11 says, Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. Now, the writer of Psalm 23 was who? King David. King David also was a shepherd. And King David was very, very familiar with the desert. He was very familiar with the wilderness, and he wrote the majority of his psalms out in the desert. This desert that is west of the Dead Sea is the Judean desert. And there are cities along the shores of the Dead Seas where David hid from King Saul. And while he was hiding, he wrote psalms. While he was struggling with issues in his life, he wrote these psalms inspired by the Holy Spirit that convey the heart of God. And Psalm 23 was one of them. Now, David was familiar with the desert, and he knew something about the desert. He knew that there were problems in the desert. And one of the problems is this. Out in the desert, they don't get much rain at all. Have any of you ever been to, to Ein Gedi? That's on the shore of the Dead Sea, where most likely this was written. Just west of Ein Gedi is this desert area where David was. It didn't rain much in the desert. When it rains in the desert, you can have tremendous floods coming down into the Jordan Valley that can wipe out buses just like that and kill people. Another thing about the desert is that it doesn't rain very much. When it does, you have problems down below, but it doesn't rain very much. And consequently, out in the desert, in the wilderness, there are many, many tracks on the ground from the sheep and the goats and the animals. Have you ever seen the tracks that are well-worn? All these different tracks. And it rains, but just a little bit, and it doesn't rain enough to erase all of these tracks. And so consequently, you have many, many paths in the wilderness. Many options. And if you take the wrong path, you can end up lost. You go to the right instead of the left, you could go for miles and never get back to where you're supposed to be because you took the wrong path. Well, the shepherd is concerned with the well-being of his sheep. And so the shepherd wants to make sure that he leads his sheep along the right path. And you know what it says here in Psalm 23? He restores my soul. Verse 3, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That word paths can also be translated tracks. He guides me in the tracks of righteousness. There is a way to walk. There is a correct path, and he guides me in that. Now, the shepherd wants to feed his people. The shepherd wants to guide his people. But the people have to listen to the shepherd. And how many of you know when you're shopping with your kids at the mall, and you're walking, and all of a sudden you realize your kids are always going off different paths. Kids, what do you, get out of the gap for a moment. Come over here. <laughs> they go over into Amber Crombie and Fitch. Get, come on, come on, kids. We got, they're always wanting to go off into these stores. And if they do, they may end up getting lost. They need to follow you. Now, in this, the situation today among Christians is complex. And my heart goes out for Christians today. For you that may be listening to this tape, my heart goes out to you because set before you is a whole smorgasbord of options. Where to go to church? Where do you get fed? Many options in the wilderness. Many paths in the wilderness. But David says, the Lord is my shepherd and he will guide me along the paths of righteousness. He'll do it. He's my shepherd. He takes the responsibility on. Now there are hundreds of options in the desert. Many of you know that Jesus established a church, which we're going to talk about in a moment. 
But then you also know that that church existed as one church until the year 1050, when the church split into East and West, two options. And then, of course, that church existed in two forms, a left lung and a right lung, until the middle of the 1500s, the Reformation. And once tradition was cut away and Scripture alone became the source of feeding and divine revelation, we went from two to many. In fact, from the 1500s until 1900, we have about 1900 new paths springing up in the wilderness. Where do we walk? Where do we go? What do we believe? And then from 1900 until now, the U.S. government has this in ink over 26,000 different paths to take. 26,000 denominations based on the book alone with people feeling fervent about it and feeling very, very convinced about it. And there it is, out there for all of you. 26,000. And we're hungry. And we're needy. And most of us, uneducated when it comes to the things of God. And so where do we go? What about baptism? What about marriage? Is it a sacrament? Is it not? What about the Eucharist? Is it transubstantiation? Is it consubstantiation? Is it just a symbol? Do you do it once a month, twice a month, every week, once a year? Who can take it? Who can't? Who interprets the Bible? Who doesn't interpret the Bible? Who gets to have a Bible? What countries even have a Bible? The list can go on and on and on. The resurrection, baptism, church authority. Are we celebrating Easter? Do you have a tree in your home at Christmas? I mean, it goes on and on and on. Confirmation. What constitutes a valid marriage? It can go, I can stand here for days and go on and on and on with the different doctrines, and you've got 26,000 choices in the wilderness. How many of you have ever felt like that before? All these choices. I don't say this in a condemning way. I say this, I say this as, as one who, I was a pastor for 12 years. I sat up on Saturday nights pouring through the Bible, trying to come up with something to feed the people, wondering in the back of my mind the whole time, am I right? Am I sure? I'm going to have to stand before God someday for this. How do I know for sure? Is there a sure path? Because if I'm absolutely right, then perhaps 25,999 others could be wrong. And so I've faced this dilemma myself. In John chapter 10, we find that Jesus says, I'll just read that to you, he speaks about himself, and he says in John chapter 10, in verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I want you to remember that, that Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm your shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am your shepherd. And so the number one thing that I want to establish is this. Jesus has taken the ultimate responsibility as the shepherd of our souls. He is the one who has stepped up to the plate and said, I am your shepherd. I love you. I will feed you. I will protect you. I will guide you. And the question is, what is he going to feed us? How will he guide us? How will he protect us? We will see that it may not be in a form that we always choose. And there are problems in the church today. We all know that. But through all of it, he manages to feed us. Why? Because he's the shepherd and we rely on his ability to feed us, not on the cleverness of men, not on the ingenuity of men or the psyche or the, the, the verbal eloquence of men, but we rely on the power of Jesus Christ the shepherd to feed us. 
Jesus said in John chapter 14, and remember, I'm building an argument here from who is, has the responsibility, we know that Jesus, to how is he going to feed us and what is he going to feed us. He says in John chapter 14, and yet right after he says to them, I'm your good shepherd, he says something that you wouldn't think a good uh, shepherd would say. He said, guys, I'm leaving. <laughs> I can imagine a oh, bummer. <laughs> And we were just getting used to this. I mean, your tapes are great, you know, you know, and you've got some real book prospects here, Lord. I mean, this, you're, this is good stuff you're giving here. And we feel so good when you talk to us. And he's saying, well, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send someone, and he is the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, and he will lead you, and he will guide you into truth, and he will remind you of all that I have said. And so he says in John chapter 14 and verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Isn't that comforting to know today that Jesus said, I won't leave you, but I will come to you. I, I will come to you. How many people do I talk to who are searching eight paths? What does this guy teach? What, what does this one teach? Well, here, come on over here and listen to this. Over here. No, we're tired of that. Over here. They've got a guy down there on Fifth Street. Come on over here. Looking, searching, desperate. But Jesus says, I will come to you. I will feed you. I am your shepherd. And so the question is, how? I would ask you a question. Did Jesus leave his teaching? Did he leave all of his teaching here on earth and then run away and say, figure it out. I'll be praying for you. It's there. It's a done deal. It's there if you want it bad enough. I'll be praying for you. Did he just leave it to the conscience of the individual to discover truth? Did he leave it to the individual to somehow themselves find this? Did he say, whatever you teach, it's okay if you guys are different in all of this, as long as you believe maybe two or three essential things? Or did he leave a deposit of faith, a quantifiable deposit of faith, and said, now pass this on? Church history teaches us that he did. He left us a deposit of faith and said, I now give my authority to certain people to pass this on. But Jesus never just threw it out there and said, have at it, go after it, just try to get along. That is not our shepherd. That is not our king and Lord. But our Lord has established a body that can teach his truth, and we will find in a moment, pass on the bread from heaven. So I'd ask that question again. Did Jesus leave his teaching to the conscience of the individual or did he establish authority? Did he establish authority? It's a matter of historical proof. He established authority. He established authority. And what is the authority? What is the pillar and support of truth? That's right. 1 Timothy 3.15 tells us that it is the church that is the pillar and the support of the truth. Now get this, because this is so important. I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 16 for a moment. Many of you are very familiar with it, but I want to share something from Matthew 16 that perhaps you've never looked at it quite this way. Matthew chapter 16. This blew my mind when I thought about this a while ago. I mean, literally, it blew my mind, and all of a sudden I've said, this answers all my questions as to how we have so many opinions out there in the world. Matthew chapter 16. We're going to start with verse 13. It says, now this is the very famous chapter where Jesus hands over the keys to the kingdom to Peter. And it says in verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, now here's a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now catch this. You've got to get this. Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Anointed One, God Almighty, the Yeshua Elohim, the Creator of the universe, 
comes to his disciples and he asks one question. We're not talking about 20 years ago. We're not talking about 10 years ago or even 400 years ago. We're talking about ground zero. <laughs> We're talking about right there with Jesus, facing the disciples, asks one question. Fellas, who do people say that I am? He doesn't start off by saying, what are people talking about, about as far as baptism? Do you guys catch anything out there? You know, he's not saying, what's kind of, give me the pulse on this resurrection thing that I've been kind of hinting about. What are, you, what, are people getting it out there? I mean, what's, what do you think? He doesn't ask him any of these types of questions. He asks them the most important question. Fellas, who do the people out there say that I am? One question, first century, Jesus is asking it. We're looking at him right in the face. There aren't years that have gone by to cloud all this. No councils yet. No church splits. No, nothing. Who do people say that I am? Now listen to the answer here. I find this very revealing. Who do men say that I am? And I can imagine the disciples talking among each other. There's, there's Matthew, you know, he's talking to Andrew. Well, I don't know, I've heard a little bit about this. Maybe John's been... And Jesus, come on, guys, who do men say that I am? And here's their answer. Some say John the Baptist, Jesus. Some say that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some say Elijah. Others, Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And now listen to this. Jesus says to them one question. Ask them one question. Who do men say that I am? And listen to their answer. Jesus said, who do they say that I am? One person says, John the Baptist. Were they right? No. They were wrong. What's another one? Someone else, the uh, Lord says, uh, let's see, I was down on 3rd Street. Some guy was saying, Elijah. You thought you were Elijah. Is he right? No, he was wrong. Uh, Lord, I was up in Galilee and there were some guys up there and they, I mean, they're, they're putting their money on your Jeremiah. <laughs> your Jeremiah. Were they right? They were wrong. And then another one said that you were one of the prophets. Were they right? Wrong. We, how many guesses do we have? John the Baptist. We have Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Wrong, 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 wrong. One question, four answers, all wrong. First century, look at them square in the face. Now I would ask you this. What are the odds of an individual being born, or those born 25 years ago, picking up a Bible down at Zondervan Bookstore, opening it up, and after 2,000 years, being right, 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 right? What, what are the odds? What I am presenting is this, that we need more than our own reflection. We need his guidance. He's the shepherd. He said he would come to us. He would lead us. He would feed us. It is more than an individual relationship between me and Christ. This is not just me and the Lord. This is not just my opinion. Peter said in his epistle, no revelation is of a private interpretation. He says it. No prophecy is of private interpretation. John the Baptist, wrong. Elijah, wrong. Jeremiah, wrong. One of the prophets, wrong. And then Jesus looks at him and he asks them a question and he says, but who do you say that I am? I can imagine at that point, Matthew, oh, well, uh, I kind of like the John the Baptist answer there. Of, I, mean, I mean, that's sort of what you're kind of like. I mean, you know, you guys talk a lot. Of, he looks at him and he says, guys, and this is, the, this is where it all happens right here. Who do you say that I am? And they look at each other, and then finally what happens? Peter steps up. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I can imagine Matthew back there going, Woo! <laughs> Bold. <laughs> but Peter says, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And at that point, Jesus' voice breaks the silence of the other disciples, and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood, all these opinions didn't reveal it to you. But my Father, who is in heaven, revealed it to you. And I say that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church.
Isn't that great news? Upon this rock I'll build my church, and I give to you the kings of the kingdom of heaven, and what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There are rabbinic sayings, the first century, juridical sayings of binding and loosing. And the catechism tells us that this gives Peter the power, establish doctrine, discipline, guidance. There's a special anointing on the vicar of Christ to guide us and direct us. And that's why people come into the presence of the, of the Holy Father and they are so moved when they come by him. Why? Because he's not just an average guy out there. There's an anointing on him from heaven to lead us and guide us and feed us from heaven that's different from the guy down the street. The guy down the street may be great, and he may be a great guy and have a lot of good things to say, but he doesn't have this anointing that Jesus is talking about and this authority that Jesus is talking about. Who do men say that I am? Why is this important? Because we will see that it is Christ that we are going to feed on. Who do men say that I am? This is the question. Who do men say that I am? Why is it important? Because ultimately we're going to see that it is Christ that we're going to be eating. And if you say that he's just a good teacher, then you're missing the mark. But if he is who he says he is, and that is God Almighty, and he says later, this is my flesh, eat it, then it's a whole different ball game. A whole different ball game. We know that Peter was given the authority. We turn now towards John, John chapter 21, at the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. And what does Jesus say to Peter? He says, in verse, starting in verse 15, so when they had finished breakfast, this is at the end now of the gospel, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, Jesus is asking a question. I'm the shepherd. I want to feed my people. I want to guide my people. Simon, Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. And if you love me, feed my sheep. You feed my sheep. And a second time, Peter, you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Tend my sheep. <laughs> I heard you. Okay, I heard you. Peter, do you love me? A third time, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. My dad, about four years ago, had a heart attack. And I talked to him on the phone because I was supposed to go to Israel the next day to teach. And I got him on the phone. He was in intensive care. And I said, Dad, I don't know how serious this is. Should I go to Israel or should I come home? My mother was with me in Dayton, Ohio to, to watch our daughter while we went to Israel. My dad got on the phone. He said, it's okay, it's okay. He sounded very, very weak. And then he paused. He said, he said Jeff. I said, yes? Take care of your mother and your sisters. And I began to cry and I said, I'm coming home, Dad. I'm not going. I said, this is serious. If my dad told me to take care of my mother and my sister, he has doubts. He has told me the most important thing in his mind right now before he could die. Take care of your mother and take care of your sisters. I said, I'm coming home. And Jesus, at the very end, says to Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. Okay, Lord, I will. So we know that Jesus would feed his sheep through Peter and the disciples with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. This is all Bible. It is right there. Jesus is the shepherd. He will feed his sheep through Peter and the disciples with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 16, John 14, John 21, John 10. It's all there. Remember, Jesus gave the keys to Peter based on the answer to the question, who do men say that I am? You got that right. The Father revealed it to you. You have authority. When you leave the authority of the Catholic Church, you run into many tracks and many paths, many voices. The Reformation took place in the middle of the 1500s, but listen to this. In the year 1577, we're talking about 20 years after. We're talking just a few years after this. 
In 1577, only 60 years from the posting of Martin Luther's 95 Thesis, a book was published in Ingolstadt, Germany, entitled 200 Interpretations of the Words, This is My Body. 60 years later, a book, 200 paths, 200 tracks to find the meaning to the words, this is my body. The hunger that we experience in the world today, the hunger around the world can be answered if we know the answer to that question. What does it mean, this is my body? This is my body. And this has led to confusion. Where do the sheep eat? I want to turn to John chapter 6 to show you where the sheep eat. And this is so beautiful. John chapter 6 is perhaps the most powerful chapter in all the New Testament when it comes to us discovering what we're to eat. You know how kids, have you ever taken them to the mall? We're back at the mall again. Take them to the mall, and if your kids have a choice as to what they're going to eat, what do you think they're going to eat? French fries. Happy Meal. <laughs> Candy. How many kids will go into the restaurant and say, Mother, I would like some peas with corn and perhaps <laughs> and just a, a, a touch of yogurt on the side <laughs> and a, a bean burger. They're not likely to do it. Because what do kids do? Kids want to, they want, we, want, we feed ourselves. It's fun, you know. We want something that's going to feel good. And <laughs> we're going to see here that Jesus, there, there are, listen, in the Catholic Church, there are, so, I, there are so many times where I could say to you, this is like dessert. This is really fun. This is great. Isn't it good to be together? Isn't it good to pray and so forth and so on? And fellowship. It's just like dessert. It's great. But there is a meal that we need that goes deeper than dessert, that's more satisfying than, than dessert. It's when your parents say, eat those vegetables, but they don't even look good, and how could they be that good for me? They don't taste good. I don't like, eat them, they're good for you. And someone may say, but I went to com com communion on, on Sunday morning, and I didn't feel like any different, I didn't taste any different or anything. Eat it. <laughs> it will change you. It will change you. We'll see that here in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is divided up into two sections. The first part of John 6 is known as the feeding of the 5,000. You've heard of it? Feeding of the 5,000. The second part of John chapter 6 is an explanation as to what happened in the feeding of the 5,000. And capture this. John 6 is also reflected in Mark chapter 6. I'm going to read Mark chapter 6 to you. But you can, you can take either John 6 or Mark 6, same story. But catch this. This is great. Mark chapter 6. This is before Jesus gives an explanation as to what the feeding of the 5,000 is all about. And what he's going to give us here, get this, is he's going to give us a model of mass. He's going to give us a model of mass. The Eucharistic celebration. Verse 33. And the people saw them going and many recognized them. And they ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. And disembarking, he saw a great multitude and he felt compassion for them. Get this. He felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I can't tell you the number of people who have come to me privately that have left the church and are belong to some independent church today that are telling me over and over and over we're having problems with our leaders. We all have problems with leaders, don't we? But they don't know what they can depend on. They don't even know where he went to school. Don't even have an idea. But Jesus comes and says that he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. We need a shepherd. They were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Notice this. He began to teach them many things. The, the, the Mass is divided up into two parts. The Liturgy of the Word, which is the first part of our meal, and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, which is the second half of the Mass. It is the meal for us. So we are going to be fed two ways. The Word of God and the body and the blood of God. 
And so here we are in the feeding of the 5,000. When it, it was already quite late, his disciples came up to him and began saying to him, The place is desolate and it is already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. I don't know if this rings in your heart the way it rings in my heart, but I know what it's like for 12 years to buy myself something to eat. I know what that's like. I ate, and there's some good stuff, but I know what that's like. What's the solution for the disciples? These people are hungry. What's the solution for the disciples? Send them away and let them fend for themselves. That is the solution for much of the world. Let them figure it out. <laughs> let them go searching in the paths. Send them away and let them fend for themselves. And what does Jesus say? He looks at them and he says, you give them something to eat. <laughs> but I'm, I got a priest's salary. I don't, I don't, I don't, what do you mean? Me? Jesus says to his disciples, to the apostles, who will find out are the priests, you give them something to eat. <sighs> what am I supposed to give them? Should I just repeat the stories you've been telling over and over? Should we do that? Should we just talk about the stories and maybe sing some songs? Or what, what are you talking about? You give them something to eat. Lord, we don't have anything. What do you have? We enter into the Mass now. The Mass is the great exchange. It's the great exchange where we exchange our gifts for his gift. Bread and wine given to him, transubstantiated, given to us as his body and his blood, soul and divinity. We give him our words, and he gives us his word. The great exchange. What do you have? All we have is, what do we have here? What do we have? This is embarrassing. What do we have? Hey, get that kid over here. What do you got over there? Five, one, two, three, five, I'll give it here. Uh, Lord, <laughs> 5,000 plus people out there, we've got five loaves and two fish. Jesus says, that's enough, give it to me. And he takes it. Who's the shepherd? Jesus. Who's got the responsibility? Jesus. How does he do it? Through Peter and the disciples with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. He says, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. And he takes it and he gives it back to the priests, the apostles, and says, give it to them. Feed them. Feed them. And the disciples, I can imagine, well, <laughs> okay. And they go to the first row, here, here, here. Jesus is standing there saying, these guys will know tonight what this means. They'll know tonight what I'm getting at here. He gives them more. What do, you, what do you do when you're out? What do you do when you're out? You don't go down to the bookstore. You don't go to another conference, although these things are important. Well, what do you do when you're out? You go back to Jesus. We're out. And he has what? More bread. Matthew says, how did you do that? Never mind. Here, just you'll find out later. Here. And he begins to feed. The whole multitude was fed. And there were scraps left over. There was stuff left over, bread left over. And Jesus says, he says, gather up all the fragments that nothing be wasted. But what did he say before they were fed? He said to his disciples, he said, have them line up in groups of 50 and 100. Why so orderly? Why so organized? What's the big deal? Just feed them. <laughs> Have them organized. Have them get into groups of 50 and 100. The early church fathers tell us that this feeding of the 5,000 is a map of mass. It's a map of the mass where we have Jesus teaching in the first part. Teaching in the first part. Giving out his word. And then the people are still. They need more than just that Bible. They need more than just those songs. They need him. And so he says, get them in groups of 50 and 100. And there are some of the early church fathers tell us that these are churches, dioceses. Get them into groups. Now you go feed them. You give them the bread. And they were all fed. And then Jesus, at the end, in John chapter 6, he begins to tell them what this was all about. He says to them at the end of John chapter 6, in verse 32, Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. 
For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They said therefore to him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. Give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. Hunger. He shall he'll not hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And then he goes on and he says in verse 48, he said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. My flesh. And the Jews, therefore, began arguing with one another right away. <laughs> right away. Don't we have arguments over what does this Eucharist mean? They began to argue, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's the question. Because Jesus is saying, I have just fed everyone. The bread is my flesh. The Jews, how could that be? How could you give us your flesh to eat? How could you possibly do that? And Jesus answers and he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. And then he says it again. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Am I reading outside the Bible somewhere here? here? No, I am reading the Bible. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And he says that my flesh is true food. I left the church because I wasn't being fed. My flesh is true food. Jesus in that last supper said to his disciples when he took that bread, this is my body. When he took that cup, this is my blood given for you, the blood of the new covenant. In the old covenant you had to eat the sacrifice, the Passover lamb. Clear back there with Abram. Abram was about ready to sacrifice Isaac. God was entering into a covenant with Abraham and there was a covenant that would bring a blessing to the entire world. Little Isaac says, Daddy, I've got the wood and I've got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? And Abram says, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Yireh, God will provide. And then he ties up Isaac and he takes the knife and he gets ready and all of a sudden he goes, Whoosh. He stopped. And all of a sudden, you remember what Abram said? He said, God will provide the lamb, Isaac. God will provide the lamb. Right when he stops the knife, what does he hear in the thicket? A ram. A ram. God will provide the lamb. 2,000 years later, John the Baptist walking, he's walking, and all of a sudden his eyes catch on Jesus and he points and he yells out, Behold, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And that speaks of Passover. And it was at the Passover celebration that Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. And here in John he says, my flesh is true food. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And in the Mass today, we have the great exchange, as Bishop Bruskowitz says in Lincoln, Nebraska. He says it's the great exchange where in the first half of the Mass, we give him our words. We praise you for your glory. We confess our sins. And what does he do? He gives us his words. I had a woman come up to me about two years ago, 
And she said to me at this dinner, she said, Jeff, I heard, of, I heard that you went back to the Catholic Church. And I said, yes. And she said, that's good for you. I, that's all, I hate that. <laughs> no, that's good for everybody, okay? <laughs> that's good for you. She said, but I'll tell you what, I had to leave, because I, I was in the church for 30 years, I had to leave because I wasn't being fed. And I said, wait a minute, you weren't being fed? Now, I know what they mean. I know what they mean, but they don't mean this. And I said, wait a minute. And I got to talking with her. I got to tease her a little bit too, but I got to talking with her. And I said, do you believe in the power of the word? Oh yeah, that's why I left. I read the Bible all the time. I said, do you believe what the prophet said, that my word shall go forth and it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I desire? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, do you believe that the word of God is sharp and active? It's act more sharper than a two-edged sword. It can penetrate to the, the bone and the marrow and spirit and soul. Yes! But I said, do you believe that the word of God will do a number on your heart? Oh, yes! How long did you go to the Catholic Church? She said, 30 years. Did you go to church every week? Every week. I said, do you realize that in the Catholic Church, you get, in the Catholic Church, a cycle of readings on Sunday, of three readings, Old Testament, Epistle, and Gospel, and that over a three-year period, you get almost the entire New Testament and all of the critical points of the Old Testament in a three-year cycle. And I said, and how many years did you do this? She, she says sort of proudly, 30. I said, so for 30 years, you heard the entire revelation 10 times. I challenge anyone here to go find a church where you'll see that where you'll hear the whole revelation 10 times in 30 years. I, it won't happen. It won't happen. It won't happen. And I said, and after 30 years of listening to the word, you finally responded. And what's the first thing that you did? You backhand your mother who fed you for 30 years. She fed you for 30 years. And the first thing you did was you backhanded your mother saying, I wasn't being fed. But here's what's more interesting, and I know this from personal experience. Many people come up to me and they say, Jeff, I left the church because I wasn't being taught. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about the Lord. And they leave, and a month later, they know everything about the Catholic Church. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? They know everything. What I would say is that God's been working on you all these years with giving you the gospel, he's been giving you the epistles, giving you the Old Testament, and you finally said, yes, Lord, yes, and you didn't recognize it for what it was, but you gave the credit to the fact that somebody did invite you to their home. Granted, we need that. You gave credit to the fact that, yes, there was an exciting song sung at another church. We need a little bit more pep sometimes in our own worship, don't we? We need a lot of things, but we do have the Eucharist, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the great exchange, what people say to me is they say, I had to leave because I wasn't being fed. But in all honesty, I would say this. You, it isn't that you weren't being fed. Let's be honest. You were not being entertained in some cases. I'm being honest. I know what, I know what I'm talking about. I know, I know the pressure. I know the pressure of having to bring a better singing group in next month than last month. I know what will happen if my preaching goes down. I know. You'll leave, and you'll go find a better preacher. I know this for a fact. And so we may say, the church down the street has such vibrant worship. It has such incredible Bible studies. The pastor is just, he's on fire, I'm telling you. All those things are good, and I'm not making light of them because that's the way I'd like to be too. I like to be on fire. I think we got a message that burns in our bones. We need priests that are on fire. We need priests that are, that are excited about the faith, you know. But listen, listen to what Jesus asks here. And this is how I'm going to conclude. Listen to what Jesus asks in John chapter 6. This is so critically important. He says to his disciples in John chapter 6, Verse 59, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? I would say to you today, this issue of Jesus and the Eucharist 
is still a difficult statement for many. Because in the second half of the Mass, what do we have? The exchange again. We bring him our bread. We bring him the wine. We bring him our whole work week. We bring him our sufferings, our pain. And we bring this all to him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is united with Christ. That bread is changed into the body and blood of Christ. And he gives us his very flesh and his blood to drink. That's the good shepherd. That's the shepherd that loves us. He gives us his very flesh and blood to drink. So we have this incredible exchange. But we don't live like we believe this. We don't live so often like this is what we're receiving. Or one man came up to me and said, Jeff, if I believed what you believe about the Eucharist, I would be at Mass every single time those doors were open if I really believed that. He said, I don't think you believe that. Oh, yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> he said, I don't think you do. Because if that is the body and blood of Christ, you would crave for it. You would desire it with everything in your being. But Jesus conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? He says, what then if you should behold the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. In other words, this cannot happen without the Spirit of God. This transubstantiation that takes place is by the Spirit of God. This is not by the flesh. This is by the Spirit of God. And then Jesus asks a very important question. Let me just read on. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you, that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, get this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. I want to underscore verse 66. Jesus said, as a result of this whole issue of the distribution of the bread, the teaching that this was the body and the blood of Christ, as a result of this, then the Jews making the remark, how can you give your flesh to these people? It says many of them left and departed. They said, this is where I get off the boat. <laughs> All the other things you're doing, they're good, but uh, <laughs> this is a little scary. <laughs> you know, this is a little weird. This is a little odd. And Jesus doesn't stop him. In fact, he looks at his disciples, and what does he say to his disciples? He asks them a question that I would like to ask you, and I'd like to ask all of you who are listening right now. He says, you do not want to go away also, do you? But listen to the answer of Simon Peter. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, and this is the question I want to leave you with, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. Lord, where are we going to go? Lord, where are we going to go? If we can't receive this Eucharist, if we can't receive your body and blood, where are we going to go? And I would ask you this question as something to think about. What will you exchange the very body and blood of Jesus Christ for? A better song? One that makes you feel better? Will you exchange the body and blood of Jesus Christ for a home group? Where you can read the Bible together? Will you exchange the body and the blood of Jesus Christ for a prayer meeting? What will you exchange the body and blood of Christ for? That's a question we all have to answer. What did we exchange it for? And what are you getting out of that today? How are you being fed? We are fed as Catholics on a diet of the Word of God and we are fed by his body and his blood. And this all takes place right there in the Mass. A beautiful, beautiful thing. I would just like to say to those that have left the Catholic Church that the banquet table is still open. 
Jesus says something so odd at the end of the New Testament. He says something that for years as a Protestant pastor I could not make sense of. He says in, in Revelation chapter 3, in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Isn't that odd? I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, John tells us that my sheep hear my voice. I'm the great shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. If anyone hears my voice, what is the voice? Rome, the Holy Father, the Magisterium, the tradition in Scripture, the full Word of God, the deposit of faith. If anyone hears my voice, is anyone hungry? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. I just want to leave you with this. We have a meal that goes beyond anything, and I want you to know something. I will not trade in the body and blood of Christ. This is why I came back to the church. I sat in the back of a Catholic church as a Protestant pastor in the back row with my head hung low, hoping nobody in the community would see me, and I sat there, and as people were going forth to receive the Lord, I sat there and I wept, knowing that's Jesus and I can't receive him yet. I want him, and I'll tell you one thing, there's no Bible study in the world that is good enough Enough or stimulating enough or nutritious enough to trade in for the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. There's no song good enough that I'll trade it in for the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And there's no Bible study good enough that I'll trade it in for the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. These things are important. <laughs> These things are important, don't get me wrong, but you and I have a fullness to be enjoyed, a fullness to share, and what needs to happen is we need to get up off our seats and begin to live this life and begin to evangelize and proclaim the good news, and we need to partake of it ourselves and live it in such a way that people will say, I see, as John 13, 34, and 35 says, I see that they love each other, they care for each other, I see the life they live, I want what they got. These people are fed and fulfilled at the table of the Lord, and they are excited people. So praise the Lord. I am so excited about this. Let me just say, I want to say one last thing, and that's this. The Holy Father wrote to the priests, and he said to them in his annual letter, he said, priests, do not be discouraged, and do not fall into the trap of thinking that you are worthless or unneeded. He said, you are needed more than ever because Christ is needed more than ever. And I'd just like to say, God bless the priests and thank you for giving your life that I can have his life. Amen. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation produced by St. Joseph Communications. St. Joseph Communications offers a wide variety of audio, video, and print materials on the topics of scripture study, apologetics, spirituality, family life, and much more. To browse the many fine products available, please visit our website at stjoe.com. That's S-A-I-N-T-J-O-E dot com. The copyright for this recording is held by St. Joseph Communications. The presentation may not be broadcast, reproduced, or redistributed in any manner or form without the express written consent of St. Joseph Communications. Thank you for listening, and may God richly bless you and your family.